Hello. Hey, uh, what's going on? What's happening, Sam? Hey, hey. Uh, welcome to Red River Podcast, Episode 9. Wow. Let's, yeah, right? We're, they had, they've yet to pull the plug on this thing. We'd like to thank uh, Les Moonves and <laughs> all the powers that be. Are we going to have like a Episode 10? Is it going to be a big celebration? Uh, <laughs> double, di- double digits? Yeah. The big giveaway, is it something? <laughs> you know what? Uh, no, but I mean, it's just <laughs> stupid enough to entertain for a second. You know? gotcha. Um, so today we're doing it out of, uh, my apartment cause mm-hmm. you know, why not? And Parker's missing. He's, he's, he's got some shit to do. Uh, but today we have, uh, Sean Cooper. Hi. Hello. Hi. Bass player from, uh, Taking Back Sunday. And of course, one of my favorites, Stray Light Run. Let me Thank just you. throw this over here. Yes. Yeah. Okay, nice and close. I could just move that over to you. Cool. All right. Um, so anyway, what's going on, man? We were just talking about the, um, I think Mark just posted about like the jamboree. Like what the hell is that? Yeah. It's a, a taking back Sunday vacation That's in awesome. Jamaica. Wow. Like, yeah. you, like, That's awesome. Yeah. That's yeah. a good day at work. We were, yeah, we were trying to plan something because we all have families and we like being together. So we tried to figure out a way to potentially get all the families together and maybe play some shows. Shit. That's right. And I guess this promoter came to us with this idea through our booking agent. I don't know. All the, the powers that be had this big plan. It is nice to have powers that be, right? Yeah, we've got a few. Yeah? They just know? send you the email and you're like... It's oh, not yeah. the Firefest people, is it? Yeah. No, no, no. Uh, yeah, we've been getting some things. blowback. People are... People are ve- I think uh, Firefest totally screwed us. Was his first name totally Ja? Yes, Ja. <laughs> yeah, named ja. But yeah, like people are like paranoid. They're like, hey, this isn't going to turn out like that, is it? <laughs> yeah. Like my, my Twitter timeline is just full of this stuff. And oh, I'm really? like, yo, no, we try and go through reputable people who've done this kind of thing before. Yeah, yeah. You know, we're not offering cheese sandwiches and stuff. And <laughs> but did, like, did you did you read up on that shit? Cause I, I, a little I, bit, not little enough. Bit. I wanted to read up some more. It seems hysterical. I was a little too obsessed with it. It was fascinating. <laughs> it I had was. to go to their Facebook page, and which was hilarious. The people writing in comments on there, and they're still doing it. Well, you yeah. know what's fucked up? It's like here you get poor little Ja Rule, probably had <laughs> yeah. nothing to do with it. Yeah. You know, probably get to to get his name out there again after yeah, like with- Fifty Cent murdered him, his <laughs> career, and he's thinking like, you know what? Uh, yo, Ja Rule, could we borrow your name to like do this? Yeah. F- yes, absolutely. Oh, you guys are doing this? Yes. Like I don't even like. Uh, and then it turns out like the footage, the actual footage from like Instagram or whatever. Uh-huh. It just looked like fucking Day of the Dead, like 1980, <laughs> like a Romero movie. <laughs> like, well, isn't the island like it's you can't live there, right? right. It's just horrible. It's like windy and weather's awful, and it's yeah, the, very remote. They, yeah. uh, as far as the flights in the bus, they had to take like a bus like three hours, and then yeah. they pull up to this place with all this FEMA tents. And set like, up. Yeah, <laughs> and they were they paid like fifteen grand or something, yeah. like outrageous. No. Like, I mean, listen, (laughs) (laughs) I'll never get enough of it. Yeah. I mean, you know, know, like their lives are going to be okay. They're going to do all right. They're going to do, you know, know, they're going to get, they're going to survive. Trust fund will be replenished, you know, but like what I'm looking forward to the most is just like the actual, um, cause everything gets an explanation. So I'm I'm waiting to hear the podcast with that guy or like yeah. one of the, one of the people like, I just need like maybe vice. will do like an hour episode on it or some it's, shit. It's not over. No, it's yeah. not over. You know, Ja Rule, like he's like his career, like couldn't have been any more over. And now it's like, he's going to be remembered now. Not only is the guy who I'd probably rather be remembered for this than that video with Ashanti, where he's dressed like Greece, right. you know, with the sweater. That's a I vi- think I'd rather go down with <laughs> the fire first. But, that's a uh, very good point. So. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. So then that's the silver lining for him. <laughs> Yo, so, um, yes, yeah. Yes. Tell me about the jamboree. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to go down there, play a bunch of shows, um, hang with the people. I think uh, my family's going to come down. And it's going to be a blast. So wow. I don't I don't know much more than that. Are there other bands playing? Yeah, we have uh, Frank Iero and the Patients. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's a dude Frank from, from my Chemical Romance. Yeah. And he's just a great dude. And we just toured in uh, the UK and Europe with him. And we're just so grateful what he is, was able to do it. What does his band sound like? I haven't even heard it. Oh, wow. They're great. They're super punky, really loud, screamy, chaotic. It's really a lot of fun. He, okay. He's excellent. He's a great musician. Which one is? Is he the one with the, the curly hair or the other one? No, no, the other one, lots of tattoos and okay. stuff. Very punk rock looking guy. Yeah. But yeah, he's just, he's 
such a, such a wholesome guy, you know, just like being around him. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know anything about the industry, but I'm going to make pretend like I do. Mm-hmm. Okay. It seems like the industry is just all going to like <laughs> cruises and, uh, you know, all this other shit. There's like different ways to, um, I guess have like the fan experience. Yeah. You know, so like for you guys to do that, blew up like, you know, this. Everybody's Listen, doing if those, kicks yeah. and LA guns could find <laughs> audiences, I mean, you know what yeah. it is? You're stuck on the on the cruise. Yeah. You know, at that point, you're just like, I as well go see LA. And I just saw LA guns, and they kind of kicked ass. So nice. Yeah. <laughs> they played Mulcahy's. Last from the past, LA guns, Mulks. Well, yeah, we we uh we we I went to go see Matt Pryor and mm-hmm. Dan Andriano, and then after that show. We're like, oh, L.A. Guns and Faster Pussycat are playing fucking uh, what Mulcahy is. So we're like, oh, let's go down there. So wow, I saw Faster Pussycat open for Kiss at the Coliseum. Wow, was that ninety two? Probably, yeah, yeah. Trickster and Faster Pussycat. Wow, yeah, I remember that tour. That I think that might have been like the Revenge tour. That's when they they that probably is they tried to like be like they were heavier on that. They were trying. Yeah, it was just trying really hard very hard yeah. and they didn't have desmond child writing their songs anymore yeah so yeah i remember like because uh hot in the shade is the one I love. <laughs> okay. yeah i'm going that, right that back. was your first record right because well, it's Kiss 89 record? i was 11 mm-hmm. that's the one with the sphinx on the front it's the one right? with the sphinx and hide your heart was on there and it was just <laughs> i'm sorry it's just so funny that that's the first kiss record that you heard but i was 11 <laughs> i know, I know. It's you know funny. like yeah. I, I wasn't like it's a bad represent i mean i'm not a kiss fan per se but yeah, uh, yeah neither a... am i i just kind of wanted to go because it seemed cool at the time yeah. well they know? must put on a hell of a show even if you're not a fan it I... was really fun it was before they put the makeup back on and stuff though okay. so yes exactly yeah. and yeah. i re- i remember I, I i i always hated kiss um i just remember being younger and watching that video and thinking it was funny and like when you're younger, like, so I was like 11, 12, from like 11 to 12, like you absorb everything, like mm-hmm. anything people give you. Sure. It's like, oh, you have a Pink Floyd thing, you have Aerosmith, you have Black Flag. It's like you give everything. And then by the time you're like 14 or 15, you're like, oh, okay, I think I kind of, I think I, I think I know what I like. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I think that's the way it goes. That's the way it happens no, I for think me. There's a formula of years where you really. You know, yeah. find the bands you love. At least for me, also, you know, yeah, ones sure. I took with me through my life. Yeah. Most of them. I think the cool part about Kiss is Gene Simmons. I think he seems about as cool as he is handsome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. I. Um. You know, if Gene is listening to this, uh, I, I'm not apologizing. <laughs> you know? take, take that for what you will. I didn't. I didn't say anything. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I said it. Um, you know. The. Yeah. I don't know. Fuck yes, that's all I'm gonna say. I so, thought it was really funny when they took the makeup off because I remember on MTV when they did it and they like went panned one by one and showed them. Like, was it really a mystery? Like yeah. they just painted their face, the hair. You could yeah. see the shape of the face. Like we saw, wow. we saw Runaway. He's still yeah. ugly. We saw Wanted Dead or Alive <laughs> with Rutger Hauer. We we know what he looks like. You know, is um, that the one with the metal spiders? When yes. He's the villain. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I yeah so we that. know what the fuck that guy looks like, please. <laughs> you know. Um, but yo, how's the tour been going for uh, Tidal Wave? Yeah. It's been awesome. You know, the response to the record's been really cool. We were pleasantly surprised because we put out records and we're not sure what people are gonna think. Does anyone though? No. You know? No. Oh, well, we thought when John and I came back to the band that when we did the self titled <laughs> record, we thought, oh, People are gonna go crazy over this one. We really nailed Mark, this is Mark, cool. Mark. We got the chemistry back. Things are great, and people did not care at all. People didn't really respond. They're like, hmm, all right, back to the drawing board. And then we put out happinesses. Things got a little bit better, but then Tidal Wave. It seems like things kind of came full circle. And that record, I'll always tell them. I'm like El Paso. That's the shit right there. Yeah, I I love that song. Mark and I talk about it a lot. We think guys like us, guys like our age yeah. and stuff. Right. That song can connect with. You could say old people. I mean, I, I don't. <laughs> I've feel come old. to terms. You know, I'm 36, but I feel like a a young kid. You know, I don't feel older than like 24. But uh, yeah, Uh, yeah, no, me too. We we thought like there was something so visceral about it. But anytime we played it live, like there's like one kid going nuts in the back by the bar, and then the rest of the crowd's just kind of arms crossed, looking at us like, "You done yet?" Yeah. But I don't know. Maybe we'll bring it back. Maybe enough time has passed where Mm -hmm. things have caught on. I I I think I will always because I remember when you guys came back, and then I hit play, and that was like the first song. I was like, "Whoa." 
Yeah, yeah, we wanted to throw people for a Whoa, loop like that. What's going on here? And then he said that's where you guys got together to mm-hmm. to make the record, so it kind of made sense. Yeah, we kind of flew down in secret because we weren't sure if it was all going to work, if the chemistry was going to be there, if just, you know, personality-wise, we'd still get along or be on the same page as what we wanted to accomplish with the band. So we just went down there without any ideas and like, hey, can we reconnect? Is this going to work? How and long were you out of the band before you? Seven came? years. Wow. Yeah. Crazy, right? Yeah. 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 Oddly enough, I think Joe Perry was out of Aerosmith seven years as well. Oh, wow. so you, yeah. you know what? So you timed it perfectly. Right? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So. Worked for Aerosmith. Yeah. yeah. And then they came us. back with a permanent vacation. Yeah. Which was okay. Mm-hmm. And once again, Desmond Child co-wrote all those songs. Yeah. And then yeah. on Pump as well. Yeah. Pump had What It Takes, which is still one of the best songs ever written. I agree. I love that song. That song still connects. Yeah. Oh, yes, you do. There goes my old girlfriend. I just say that to get you to sing Ah. every episode. (laughs) No, I I really, I'm not. I had permanent vacation. I never was a big Aerosmith guy. Neither was I. But But I had I respected them, and I wanted to see, and I I, I didn't get pumped on it. You know know what I liked? Once again, being a young kid and watching the video for Ragdoll. Um, he was making out with every girl at the end of the video. Mm-hmm. I thought that was the coolest thing because he was like tonguing them. Yeah. <laughs> so he's like driving and he's making out with this girl. And like back then, you didn't see people kiss with tongue on TV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> this guy didn't give a shit. Pornography. So he. <laughs> 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 so fucking. Um, he he makes out with the girl, jumps in the car, waves goodbye to her. Then the next house, there's another girl waving at him. Uh, yeah. Then the next house is it. I just thought it was funny, you know? Like, He's giving everyone diseases. I that. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know. And you get an STD. <laughs> and you get an STD. He's like the Oprah of STDs. Yeah. My only memory of that video is, uh, is it Joey Hamilton, the drummer, playing the two bass drums like this? Yeah. yeah. That's it. <laughs> Joey I don't Kramer. Know why. Oh, that's what it that was. Yeah, well, you like, got Tom, Tom Hamilton, Hamilton and Joey <laughs> Kramer. Yeah. Well, there's Joe Perry, Tim yeah, Tyler, and the Joes. other three guys. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. Right. And then his he brought his daughters in for the videos. So yeah. I just watched rewatched that thing you do. That's a good one. She's so did that. I. Was isn't Fun that movie. so fucking great? I think between that and Almost Famous, like those are like the two best, like actual movie movies. Yeah, ah, uh, music movies. Mm-hmm. So. Almost you know? Famous is fantastic. Like when they're like uh, on the plane and they think they're gonna die. <laughs> so I forgot who that happened to. That's an actual story. Yes. I Definitely who... not Skinner. No, 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 yeah, no. We all know how totally that. Totally different ending. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> a little bit darker. But. Yeah, shout out to them. <laughs> it wasn't Zeppelin, was it? Because it, it it's been. based on Cameron Crowe's experience yeah. following Zeppelin around initially. But I'm sure, like he, it takes you know, from yeah, all of course, different parts of his life. But, I, I'll, uh, I'll look that up. Definitely. I just always related to that kid and his love for music and what a new world it was. You know, when you oh, yes. first discover it when you're young, it's it's amazing. Beats that, man. you know, and like. Uh, his mom, just everything, every, every character in that. When you came up, you know, deciding mm-hmm. you wanted to play music, who was, what was some of the stuff you listened to, like your early exposure? That the got- first thing I remember is like hearing uh, Back in the USSR by the Beatles in my dad's Monte Carlo. Mm-hmm. And it just connected and realizing like this is what rock and roll is. I was probably like three or four years old. Wow. Wow. wow rock and roll is cool. I like this. And I couldn't tell you why. Like the voices, the melodies, the guitars, like everything about it, it just really, I don't know, connected with something deep in me. And then, so I listened to them and the Beach Boys and stuff because that's mm-hmm. what my parents listened to. Fucking everyone's parents were listening to cool shit but mine. <laughs> <laughs> what are your parents listening to? <laughs> Fucking garbage, yo. Like, the, I, I found a cassette in my mom's car and it had like some cool shit but other than that it was like go- like d- like dance disco okay it was like two hispanic kids in queens like you know yeah i think my parents were a little too old for the disco era yeah you know so i think they just missed it by whatever so yeah because my really. like i think my parents had me when they were like 21 and 23 okay so and uh but yeah they had terrible taste but so <laughs> what um so, so you listened to that yeah and uh when did you decide that maybe you wanted to buy an instrument. Well, th- so this is crazy. So then I got I got super into Guns N' Roses. Is this in Baldwin? Right after that. Yes, in Baldwin. Nice. In Baldwin, I got uh, mostly due to the influence of Alex Samarud and our mutual friend. Love that guy. Yeah. So 
he was my best friend, Neil Amarudin's older brother. Of course. And, you know, everything he listened to, I just thought was so cool because he, he continues to have really great taste. <sighs> Miss Neil. Yeah, I, yeah. Never see him. Yeah, me neither. Me neither. Yeah. But, uh, so I just kind of looked up to whatever he was doing, whatever poster he on, had on his wall I wanted to get. I got Motley Crue records because yeah. he had like uh, Shout Out the Devil stuff on his wall. Well, Those guys look nice. nuts, especially that chick singer. Yeah. <laughs> well, we just did we did an episode where we did a top five uh-huh. um, hair metal records of right. all time. And Alex sent in his top five. Uh-huh. And his top five was all Motley Crue. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. It's true to That's form. Awesome. I love it. <laughs> But yeah, so because of because of Slash and seeing uh, live at the Ritz on yes. MTV, M- M- Neil had the had a tape that he recorded, and we watched that tape over and over again. And it had the rockumentary too before it, so we just watched that whole thing on like a loop every time we hung out. And I'm like six, seven years old, and then my dad made a copy of that tape because you couldn't just you know right. burn something or no, pass it no. on very easily you know you just, my dad didn't know we didn't have two vcrs to hook up yeah. to, so he brought it to a place got a copy made and i got that for christmas and i watched it like crazy so that led to me with my money i got from this is so long on the money from my first communion mm-hmm. i bought my first guitar and amp with nice. so i had my parents take me to the store and i bought i bought this little red guitar you know child size and everything so yes. like seven years old and so yeah, you, you were in it yeah. early. You yeah. Know. I was not I yeah. was a late bloomer. Yeah, I was a late bl- I was like Yeah, no. So But yeah, Guns N' Roses, I was like, I have to do what they do. Like they get paid a lot of money to do that. How do <laughs> I make that happen? <laughs> I was like chicks and drugs and all this at like a yeah. very young age. I'm like, yes, all that. I'm just please. picturing you at seven thinking about seven. chicks and drugs. Man. Yeah. That's yeah, awesome. I'm a weird kid. First you man. get the money. Yeah. Then you get the women. Yeah, then you right. get the power. Yeah. Yeah. At seven. That, yeah, and, but I was, I was also watching the first Rambo movie too. Yeah. Like I recorded it from TV. So at it's that over, age, Johnny. I connected with a Vietnam veteran with PTSD. <laughs> it's over. Weird. It's kid. over, Johnny. I love that. Clip. It is over. Yeah. <laughs> And he just turn it off. <laughs> Anytime on Facebook somebody deserves that, I just find that clip of yeah, it. It's so over, awesome. Johnny. It still works. <laughs> Him melting down. We watched that movie on the bus, uh, John from my band and I, late at night in the UK. And it's just, that scene is so powerful and so sad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like crumble. Did you, what, did you watch the, uh, the last one? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Number four. Yeah. Yeah. The carnage is unbelievable. It's, it's so hysterical. great. It's ridiculous. The yeah. amount, like, it, I feel like people's skins were, like, flying off. It set off. a record for the most kills, like, oh, in a it? movie. I yeah, believe. believe it. Yeah. He's just ripping through everyone. Because uh-huh. we, were, we were debating, because I thought last, like, last show we did, we, we figured Invasion USA with Chuck Norris. There's a lot. It has to. We, we got to look. Like You, you know what, though? Like... You, he had a lot. He had that bazooka shit. Yeah. So he's gonna take out a lot, but you don't see all that. Like he was picking people off. Like you saw, like yeah. all the kills almost. And it, you know what was great about it was Everything. they don't make movies like that anymore. No. With the one guy, that's some eighty yeah. shit. That's right some there. eighty yeah. shit. <laughs> that's what I love about Sylvester Stallone. I feel like he's gotten to this point in his career, like he doesn't give a shit anymore. He's gonna do exactly what he yeah. wants because that's what's always worked for him. Yeah, oh, he's fucking. That's up. how the Expendables came about. Yeah. Like, let's get all these dudes together. The Expendables. Yeah. I mean, they've a... gradually gotten like him. Hey, uh, no, but the first one was such a great idea. Yeah. And I love the fact that like Van Damme was like, "Nah, I'm not doing it." And yeah, then yeah. Uh, he ended up joining like later on. I think. Yeah, right? that, well, he got that. He did that movie, that self-titled movie. J J C V D. Yeah, but it was in. French. It was very good. Was it? And uh, yeah, like he almost was really acting. Like it was impressive. <laughs> he was playing himself, but you know, as an action hero, but stuck in some kind of hostage. But wasn't situation. it in, in French? Um, or, or it was or Belgium. Was he from Belgium? Oh, right? whatever. Yeah, the muscles from Brussels. The muscles from Brussels. So uh, I think he got like for I'm a minute. A he was feeling himself like, yeah. I can be a you know the Oscars coming. Yeah, you know? but it's like <laughs> fuck it, I'll do Expendables too. Amazing, yeah. I love that shit. Yeah, but the '80s, like you said, like it was all you needed was that one name, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and then that one name needed to have a friend that got killed in the movie somewhere in the yeah. beginning. He just needed an objective to go somewhere with a lot of bad people, <laughs> rescue a woman, POW or whatever the fuck it is, something yeah. for the USA. Yeah. Oh, of and course. And then just a bunch of nameless foreign people <laughs> and fucking kill them. That's it. Yeah. 
That's sad, man. It was like three, four hundred deaths at a clip for all those movies. Yep. I love it. Yeah. So, um, all right. So then you start. You grow up in Baldwin, uh-huh. and uh, when did you get your? Did you did you buy a guitar first or, or a bass? A guitar. Yeah, it was, it was a guitar first, and I took a couple lessons and stuff. Did and you? it was really hard. To press down those strings. Yeah. Mm. You know, I was learning like folk songs and stuff. I'm like, I want to learn how to play like Slash. And my guitar teacher at the time was like, well, you know, you got to learn the basics. And I was like, ah, I don't want to do that. So I kind of just gave up on it. But I was always connected with music, and I picked up uh, the first instrument you could play at my school, went to Lennox School in Baldwin, was the Suzuki violin. So I started playing a little violin, but I really wanted to play saxophone. So fourth grade, picked up a saxophone. By sixth grade, I was like, all right, I'm getting a bass. A lot of my friends were playing guitar and stuff. I'm like, mm-hmm. I want to do something a little different. I don't know what a bass does, but it's big and it looks cool. Let's, yeah. let's go. So I got that for my 12th birthday in sixth grade. I got a PV Foundation bass guitar. God damn, you're nice. like, this guy is yeah. not playing. <laughs> you know? That instrument. No that wonder instrument. he does it for a living. Yeah, really. Yeah, like, oh, Jesus That's Christ. Awesome. That's where I went wrong. <laughs> that, that was like the, the, I think one of the things where Mark and I really connect in life is knowing what we wanted to do at a really young age. And I don't know why that happened, but it, it was. And we always worked really hard in the bands we were in together because we started playing in bands around that same time, around seventh grade and stuff. Yeah. And we just had some kind of drive to write songs together, to make music, to create. And we always took it a little bit more serious than any of the guys that were in a band with us. Yeah, well, I mean, that paid it off. It like you had a big picture plan, you know? But yeah. For some other guys you might play with, just like, yeah, it's fun, you know? And the thing better. is, is like, yeah. so you figure Adam was playing bass. Mm-hmm. And then Mark jumps in, um, replacing the old drummer. Um, Adam takes over Antonio's spot. Yeah. And then from there, um, Mark pulls you in, man. Well, this, this is actually odd. This is like one of those little like blessings in life that yeah. you don't really realize at the time. Is that before Adam moved up to, from North Carolina, I knew there was an opening for bass and Taking Back Sunday. And I thought the band was really good, but I, you know, I, it was a little rough around the edges. And I wanted to try out. And Mark, I was playing in a different band with Mark, and he, I'm like, dude, you got to get me a tryout, please. And he's like, nah, dude, you're not ready. You're not ready. Because I was a mess in high school. Like, I was just a lunatic. Like, I didn't really go to school and stuff. I didn't really leave my room. I wasn't really showing up to band practices for our other little band. Thank you, just... Guns N' Roses, for that influence. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But, I, yeah, I had a lot of, like, different <laughs> stomach problems, depression, this and that. Oh, man. Yeah, so I just, like, I didn't leave the house. And so Mark was like, dude, you're, you're really not ready. And I'm like, come on, man. That, that's not cool. And... Finally, after Adam had already made the move to to leave his life in North Carolina, he called Eddie, Mark called Eddie, and he goes, listen, man, can we get my friend Sean to try out? You know, like, I know there's this North Carolina kid coming up, and but my friend Sean's a really good bass player. He's like, no, dude, this guy left his life behind in North Carolina. He's coming up to play bass. The spot's his. I committed that to him, and, and we can't do it. And I was kind of bummed at the time. I'm like, all right, whatever. We'll see how this plays out. But from then on, it was kind of like, okay, if something happens, if something changes, I kind of had my foot in the door yeah, from course. having that talk with, with Mark. <clears throat> so suddenly things changed. Antonio, who sang, left the band, and Eddie was just like, Adam, you're singing. You're taking down the bass. You're falling down because you're all over the stage playing bass. Got to take that thing off you. And you're the front man. I know you never sang in a band before, really. You're doing it. Amazing. You're, yeah, I mean, because I went, I went to the shows, too, and I could see Adam was so charismatic and magnetic you watch the bass player of the band like this is weird <laughs> you know he's the guy but yeah. you got this guy singing and then you got a guy who's playing guitar and singing too and but you're drawn to that guy and so when that happened i was like mark you're getting me in i'm gonna try out i'm gonna crush it and that's what happened i went down to mark's basement we had a practice to try out and yeah i got in the band awesome nice. crazy man um and then from there i guess you just hone those songs like i told mark mm-hmm. and nothing was better than that uh beautiful girls sample. right that's the shit man yeah yeah i think I'll always adam, remember adam that. and john were watching that movie a lot and we're like you know so that's a michael rapaport that's yeah. what it was yeah so. let's see if we can work that into the song and they put it in the intro like oh that's magic that's yeah. great i remember when i when when i got the 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 actual full length i was like waiting for it and i was like oh yeah how, how dare you guys <laughs> but then i guess i didn't put into you know i'm like oh yeah you guys need to like pay a zillion dollars for that and i don't think victory was going to do that well that's the thing like no one knew that our band would do 
anything. Yeah. I think the budget for Tell Your Friends was like $10,000, which to us was all the money in the world. And back then, yeah. like, that's not that much. Like, no, it, it was it was peanuts because we ran out of time. Like, the way the reason why Tell Your we would have made a million changes, but we were way yeah. out of time, way over budget yeah. and everything, and it was just a mess. Did you Adam record it here it. on Long Island? Or? No, we recorded no, it was Jersey. in Jersey City Jersey. at uh, Big Blue Meanie Studios. Gotcha. Yeah. So um, we were just trekking into there every day and stuff. So you're pretty psyched to like you get in and then from there like victory comes sniffing around and then like, oh yeah, we're going to put this record out, you know, and then all the kids start coming to the shows. Do you remember like the first show that you were just like, oh shit, I think this is kind of uh, working right now. There were like a few moments we would play at Ground Zero in Balmore. Yeah. And our friends would come out. And there'd only be a handful of people. And it'd be the other bands that were playing, the other eight, ten bands. Backstreet Blues. Yeah, yeah, Backstreet Blues. And it was all right. But as our as we released the demo with Adam singing on it, more and more friends would show up more consistently. Like, oh, we're doing something right. And then maybe after the demo had been out a couple months, because you know, you only play a show or two a month. Um yeah. all our friends started singing along. Like, this is really cool. cool. This is great. And then it would be growing and growing. Then next thing we know, Ground Zero is like packed out while we're playing. You know, I don't know if they ever sold out, but certainly there was no more room in that tiny bar. Legendary. Like, I mean, you you always hear hear the stories of of like just basically the amount of people that were coming to to your shows. Um, And and then from like those small venues are awesome, right? Yeah. Yeah, totally it was cool. unbelievable. The vibe was so I just I, I went to go see Face to Face last night at mm-hmm. the Knitting Factory in Brooklyn. Awesome. They, <clears throat> they were doing like this, like uh, I guess like a 20-year small club yeah. thing before they do a tour. And like th- there's nothing like just the intimacy of oh, yeah. like, Absolutely. you know, because once your band gets big, it's like great for the band and great maybe for yeah, the newer sure. fans. It, but like, you know, no, you're like, ah. beats that, man. Yeah. No. It was just like so... So perfect last night hearing those songs. So That's awesome. Um, so then, it, it, as time goes on, I guess the you know the situation um, where you left was like how long after the first record came out? It's a little over a year. Okay, so you guys are touring the record and all Constantly. that other stuff. Um, and you guys did was that the one where you guys did the video with Flavor Flav? I that that is my bass playing, but Matt Rubano is playing bass in the video. So oh, I, had, I had, yeah. I had, yeah, yeah, I had just left, but they wanted to put out, out another single to make the band. I, I forget the exact timeline of everything, but I think they put it out as like kind of a stopgap before, while the, the touring might have held off for a minute. I forget exactly how it lined up, but um, yeah, yeah. So, so that was the song I had played on, but they wanted to kind of introduce Fred and Matt to, F- to the and they, uh, they get a flavor flavor on the video. Yeah, 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 that was all yeah. Mark. I know that's what he told me because I was like, "Yeah, who the fuck got Flav?" Yeah, he's like, "Me." Yeah. <laughs> and and that that was kind of a thing too. Like the band wanted to make Mark had the idea, and the band really wanted to make Mark happy for staying. You know, so mm-hmm. they're like, "Oh, you had this idea? Ah. Okay, like let's do it, man." Yeah. So, what so was the, your reasoning for uh, leaving? Mainly, like, uh, like. Everything got so chaotic so quickly. Right. And there was a lot of like interpersonal stuff. Sure. Whatever. But more than that was that I wasn't sure. I was like, is this what I really want to do with my life? Like something seems off about this. You know, you're, you're, all your dreams are coming true, but there's something that like didn't line up with like, me. Like as far as career wise or like vibe chemistry wise? It was, it was all of it. It was, it was like, I felt like the machine had gotten away from us. We were having, I, I felt like we lost control because it got so big so quickly. I felt like none of us had a say anymore. I remember we, we were signed up to do the whole warp tour. And before the warp tour, we were going to have like two weeks off after we'd been on tour, like the full year. And then that got suddenly whittled down to like four days or something like that. For, from who? Like victory? Oh, no. I mean, it was all kind of us, like okay. different opportunities we were getting mm-hmm. and everything. And I guess they were kind of just being approved or maybe like the message wasn't being communicated to all five of us. And it got scary for a minute. I was like, wait a second. I thought we were going to have some time. I, I can't like we've just been on the road a year. I thought we're now we're going to be out for like two and a half months on the warp Tour, like every day 
I'm going to be gone from home. And remember, I was a kid, like I just said, in high school who didn't really leave my bedroom. Yeah. Now I'm all over the country and going all over the world. That's a lot to process. Yeah. So my uh, head yeah. was just spinning. And I, so it was just one of those things. I was like, something is really wrong here. And this isn't for me. I got to go. When I knew John would potentially be out, I was like, you know what, man? I'm going with you. I don't know what we're going to do. But I know this isn't right right now. Yeah. And I was so sure of it. I didn't know what my next move would be or anything, but I knew I couldn't do that. Do you feel um, that maybe it was just, geez, you know, because like back then, like you didn't know what it was going to turn into. No. I mean, I would imagine it would probably be a little bit harder to, you know, to leave something when you, when you um, like at this age. Oh, certainly. I mean, I was 22 years old. So you were just like, all right, man, I'm, I'm out of here. There's no like because at that point, it was like I'm sure you guys weren't making a ton of money with victory, you know. But well, we were making a lot of money from touring, from touring, you know, and like I remember I think there was a video we had of like we had merch money and all of a sudden we had like 20 grand in Ziploc bags. We're wow. Like, hey. John, you want to feel like what it feels like to be hit with $20,000? Yeah. And we just threw all the cash in the bags at him. <laughs> and yeah, I think we filmed it. There, there should be some video servicing. But yeah, like it was kind of getting out of control. Like the money was good, but I never had any money before. So like none of it really added up. I'm like, this is cool, but I still live in my parents. I don't really have yeah. any bills. Yeah. So what's well, money? Like, yeah, this going? is nice. Yeah. yeah. And I didn't have any idea of like a future or of it even being a career. Like, we had never known any band to make it that big. We knew the movie life guys and they had made it and they were working and stuff, but I didn't know that it could potentially be a career. I thought at some point I'm going to have to stop this and go, go back to home to depot school. or some shit. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or whatever, whatever the case may be. Now it's definitely like the home depot route. But back then I was in school for computers and stuff. So I'm like, maybe I can get a computer oh, you degree. Were... I can do the thing. And that was like the ground level right there. Yeah. 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 Did you ever stick with that? No, no. As soon as the band took off, I was just kind of like, yeah, wow, that was really boring. <laughs> yeah. I get it. So th this is really cool. Maybe I can do this. So there was no kind of idea. I'm like, John and I will maybe try doing this band. If it doesn't work, then I'll, I'll go back to school. But you, that was as far as it went. So you, you like you like playing. You yeah. like being on stage probably, but it was all the other stuff, the business and the things like that, that was a little like hard to get a handle on. Yeah, because of. it had always just been playing shows with your friends and writing songs because you loved it, not because mm -hmm. you had to. And in between tours, we were trying to write songs. And it was, it was kind of working out. We were getting some ideas down, but it's like – you have your whole life to, to make write your that first, first record. one. Yeah. Right. And then you have a very finite amount of time to make your second. And that, that felt crazy too. That like pressure has here. to be. Yeah. Yeah. We're on this time crunch and now we have expectations. Yeah. yeah. Would you make use your illusion one or two? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and being that young too. I mean, geez. Yeah. So, yeah. So I just had to pull away and it's like, I tell a lot of, uh, a lot of people about like relationships. If you see your friend in like a dead end relationship, and they're kind of just sticking with it because there's comfort there. Right. You know, I, with, with taking back Sunday at that time, it was one of those things. If it's not right, it's wrong. So I got to go. Wow. And, and so that like, you know, obviously John leaving, mm -hmm. um, you were already, you, you had that, I guess all you needed was that push. Well, he and I kind of discussed before we left, like, Hey man, like if, you know, I can't do this anymore. You can't do this. Like, let's take a break. Was and the initial idea was to kind of like take a break and maybe take the summer off in my head. Yeah. And maybe we'll, we'll just take a few months. We'll, we'll breathe and then we'll get back together and see if we can do something. But the momentum would have totally stalled for the band. It probably would have killed the band. Mm. And we weren't sure if John and I were ever going to come back anyway. So my initial idea, um, there was stuff. John and I had this conversation about committing career suicide and that was taking the summer off and yeah. then maybe we'd reconvene at what, a later time. What did Mark say to you? I, I don't remember. We we had all talked and Mark was kind of like, yeah, man, I'm in. I'm in too. Like, I, I want to go. I want to go wow. with you and John. You guys are my friends. Yeah. And Yeah, because well, I figured, I mean, like, you yeah. guys are like best friends. Like, I can't imagine what it's like for him because it's so torn. It's like, here yeah. you are. It's like, your dreams are slowly coming true. Yeah. But like your boy is like, mm -hmm. I'm out of here. And it's like, oh, shit. It's like, do I like leave or do I continue playing? Yeah. So. Yeah. So he was he was in with us initially. And then he's just like, listen, I, I can't I can't leave this great thing behind. And I totally understood. Oh, yeah. he, he tried yeah. very hard to get me to come back even without John. And I was like, dude, I like, I just can't, I, I don't know why, but something is stopping me. And I'm really grateful for that now 
because I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you. I think things would have been really wacky had I stayed in the band. Yeah. So oh, that's crazy. Yeah. Um. And and how long did it take for that first Stray Light? Would you guys do an EP first? I don't remember. I just remember we, the record. We we back in those days it was crazy because it was 2003. I think it was fall of 2003. By the time we had our demos, we put them up online for free. Which was it is MySpace? Some, What's that? MySpace? No, no. This is even pre MySpace. I mean, to to my knowledge of the internet, yeah. we didn't have MySpace, but uh, through Absolute Punk, they hosted the songs, okay. and we just had them for download yeah. on our website. You click the MP3, and what you was got the, it. What was the? How many songs did you have up? I think we had five songs. I think um, so. Existentialism on prom night. Um, mistakes we knew we were making. It's for the best. Um, and two more. Okay. Yeah, so we, we just threw those up, and it worked out incredibly well for us. Well, did that, you jump right into that? Or yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Like the the second we we knew we were out, John and I were working on songs. He had like a little <clears throat> demo idea of the piano part for existentialism as he was putting it together. I'm like, that's that awesome. Fucking song is you know, and not not you know, I'm not sucking dick here. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's one of the best songs I've ever heard. Even back then, I, I was just like, it's perfect. And I Thank like you. that you guys sometimes play it, right? Sure, sure. Yeah, we did. We haven't played it for a little bit, but yeah, we definitely did initially. And Mark was a big part in writing that song, too. We we worked on that song, the three of us, in Mark's parents' basement uh-huh. um, while oh, he okay. was hanging out with us and, and thinking about coming with us. This Mark's a pretty on. good songwriter. Oh, yeah. He's, he's got He's got phenomenal ideas. Yeah. And his beat really drove that song and propelled it in yeah. a different direction he's, than I thought it would he's, go. Man, we, we did a, something with Alex and him uh-huh. called Carlos Danger. Yeah. Um, and like I just remember his playing. I'm like, man, I'm like, fucking guy's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> but Very that song, um, what I liked about Straylight a lot, especially on that first record, is I think the piano and the keys make it, like it just adds a different element yeah like you get the minor chords you get this like melancholy part of it mm-hmm. um the open the opening song uh with perfect ending yeah to start a, a record with with perfect ending like i always like that you know like, thanks and also that was the thing too coming from coming from taking back sunday where we said we're gonna hit you with this really dreary ballad yes. <laughs> and see what happens and and i think that that almost like is where the career of stray light went. Like, I think it just was like, you know, whatever you think we're going to do, we're probably going to do something a little bit different. Yeah. It didn't work out too well in the end, but it doesn't even <laughs> fucking matter no, it doesn't. because yeah, you sent me some stuff to yeah. listen to. And I, I loved it. Man. Oh, thank you. It, it really just brilliant. I feel like, like when that, re- you know, if that reunion ever happens, you know, five, <laughs> yeah. five years from now, whatever, you know, like, um, I really dig that first record. And then what I really like on that first record, which I thought was super heavy, and maybe I'm having my own interpretations that I'll keep to myself, but the the Martyr song. Uh-huh. Sympathy for the Martyr. Fuck. Yeah. Just heavy. And um, how did uh, his sister join? Michelle. John and, I, John and I were driving around. We were working on demos at uh, Mike Sapone's. And... I think we were, we were driving to, to work on songs and it was after, after Mark had uh, rejoined Taking Back Sunday. I mean, he never really left officially, but when he was you back got with, Will with Taking Back right Sunday, away? Even, even before that, um, John brought up, he said, hey, you know, my sister's been writing some songs and he was kind of living with her at the time. And he's like, I think she could be a really cool addition to the band. And I, I knew Michelle in passing, but, you know, we certainly weren't, friendly you know we were friendly but we weren't friends you know she was doing her thing and i was getting drunk with john was she older or younger she is a year she's she's uh younger than john and like a year older than me okay and um i was like wow that's interesting now a female in the band i've never had a girl in the band because you know we were band dorks and no (laughs) girls wanted to hang out we had so many friends like dude you guys are in your parents basement working on songs like why don't you have any girls around like I don't know, girls don't want to hang out with us. Yeah. But it's hold on, like I got that. a chorus. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I said that's a that could be an interesting idea. Like let's see. So we brought her in to to add her voice to some of the demos that John and I and, and even Mark had worked on, and I said this is a great element. And then I heard some of her songs she had written. I said those are excellent. 
This Did, is a totally different thing than I'd ever imagined for this band, but cool, let's go with it. Now, um, she joined, what, on the second, on the EP, or was she... No, she was there. She has two songs of her own oh, you're right. on, the, on the first You're right, line. actually. You're right, actually. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I feel like her presence was more felt on the EP. She kind of like really came into she her kicked, own there. She kicked the, the, the EP off. Yes, yes. Um, and also, like, what I really like about Straylight, which um, just from a songwriting aspect, is um, everything, like just the dynamic, once it builds... You know, you guys were a very building band, yeah. like, um, and and it always ended up with like something really anthemic and like repetitive. So by the time it was over, the song was over, and that thing just kept spinning in your head, and it it, it reminded me a lot of like old Elliot Smith stuff. Okay, you know, yeah, where it's just like yeah. everything is nothing to like. Oh man, mm-hmm. like that type of shit. Um, so that record comes out. You guys do a video for for existential. Yes. Um, MTV picks it up. Yeah. What are you thinking at that moment? You're thinking like, oh shit. Well, this is funny. I was telling my wife this story the other day. We're sitting on. Shout our out bus. to your wife. Yeah. What's up? <laughs> <laughs> she's totally never gonna listen to this. Yeah. Anything I do, she's like, okay, yeah. Do you love no one still hasn't no. listened to one. I was gonna say no one is. Doing <laughs> <laughs> How was the show? Great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but um. We were, Straylight was on tour. I think we were opening for something corporate in Arizona. And during, Great, I get it. Yeah, yeah, Because yeah. I was thinking Jack's Mannequin. Yeah, yeah. Lot, we were very lucky spirits, to, to get on tour with I'll the, shut the fuck guys. up. Go ahead. All good. But we're, we're watching this MTV2 countdown or something. And we saw a lot of bands that we were familiar with were in the countdown. It's like, I don't know, I think... Taking Back Sunday was like number 16. The used might have been 15. I'm kind of like, okay, we're not making the countdown. That's a bummer. Then we went in. Maybe we sound checked, did something else, came back about a half hour later, and we were up like number four. I was like, what? Really? I got awesome. Nice closer to you. Yeah, so, um, yeah, yeah. So we saw we were like number four on the countdown, and we couldn't believe it. We, we didn't know we were getting any push anywhere, and right. we saw that. We're like, wow. Things are what really label cool. were you this on? This was on Victory. 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 Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. Um, how long does like a video like that take to make? It was all day. All day? Yeah, one day. Uh, yeah. We rode the train in Jersey back and forth and back and forth. It's really cool. Victory gave us the budget to do something like that. I think it's pretty expensive to rent a train for an entire day. Yeah. And close yeah. down the track. But yeah, we just it was awesome because we just had to sit there. Now, just real quick, like how like so when you guys left... Victory was like, oh, we'll just put out this record too. Like, were they? Yeah, they had uh, they had the option on anything anyone oh, did. Gotcha. So we had discussed it. Bastards. I mean, yeah, I mean, it was there was a lot of good to it because we could have gotten bought out. Yeah. Um, we talked to a few majors and stuff who were who were somewhat interested, but we knew that the best option would be to stick with what we knew, and they were really excited to work it. Um, and I really think they did a great job for us. You know, I know they're. A lot of people have their horror stories and stuff, but with Straylight, um, they really stuck by us. Yeah, I mean, if you had a great experience with them, then that's, I mean, good for you. Um, everyone, you know, it's you're going to rate everyone on how they treat you. Sure. So if they were cool to you, so then that's awesome. Um, now that record goes out, and like, you have to be thinking, like, you know, hey, maybe, maybe this is all going to work out at the end. Yeah, yeah, we felt we felt really great about it, and we were really surprised that anyone cared. I mean, our first show that we had as a band was at the downtown. It was like 500 people sold nice. out in advance. R.I.P. Like, downtown. Whoa! Yeah, right. yeah, downtown was great. So many <laughs> yeah. great memories. And I was just like, yeah, we're off to the races. This is great. And then we did a tour. Um, we, we toured on that through 2004 and 2005, and things were, things were going pretty great, but um, things turned pretty quickly and then i saw uh what is that uh big shot yes as soon as i heard it i was like this is really different but I, you know what it is i don't know what it is like when something's geared to like music nerds i mean sometimes it just misses the masses that yeah i mean that that worked out pretty well for us it wasn't until after that mm-hmm. the things really like shat the bed yeah so great video too thank you that one was really fun we we met with the uh, the director Travis Kopach, and we discussed a whole bunch of different ideas and and different treatments, and he had that one written, and we said, you know what, I think that could be awesome, 
Like, yeah, they'll swim around in a tank. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, they're very cool. I mean, what, what did Isaac do on this? Isaac played, uh, some crazy guitars on that song. Yeah. God, he, he did stuff with his whammy bar on his flying V. Like the bow, 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 bow. The yeah, Alex, in the Alex told me, Alex is like, yeah, he, Isaac did a lot of the weird shit on there. He did. He added so much like to the, to the atmospheres of that song in particular and a bunch of, I forget, I forget what else he did on the EP, but he did a lot more with the songwriting and stuff on the following record that no one heard, unfortunately. So everyone's feeling good. The EP's yeah. going, um, the video is getting played because I guess they were still, MTV was still kind of like a thing. What year yeah. are we talking here? Like, this is 2004, 2005. Oh, was it? Okay. Wow. Yeah. That yeah. One? MTV2 was MTV2. Like playing, the, playing the music, handling the music, and yeah. MTV was whatever well, you know, well, it is now. You know, I, I whatever it is, and I get it, you need ratings. Yeah. You know, like Teen Mom and all that other shit people watch. Like, when you can go to YouTube and just, it's like, oh, okay, yeah. I'm going to type up what I want to watch. Well, uh, MTV, like, I, I, I've always said I read that book about the history of it. You know, it's meant to be this fluid thing that was just going to cater to whatever the, you know, the teen things. Yeah. They were just going to constantly adapt. DJ's out. Yeah, that it's like Menudo. And you know, when you hit a, <laughs> hit a certain age, you're yeah. going, Yo, man. Ricky out. <laughs> they yeah. and they chopped the M in half because that was supposed to mean something. You know that? No. Like later on, like they cut it, and it was like signifying that like um, it's no longer music. Really? Okay. Yeah. Wow. Yo, Google that shit. Fun fact. Yeah. Well, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so then that comes out, everything's going good. Like, were you guys running parallel with, with, with Taken Back? You know, were so, you still- we actually, oddly enough, we played, we played the same radio show in Rhode Island and that was kind of weird. What's up, bro? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I hung Is out with the Mark. first time you cross paths with well, you, you, oh, directly, directly that, like that. Right. Yeah. But you yeah. always talk to Mark. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And Mark and I like went and had a whole bunch of beers before the show and yeah. everything. <laughs> but I think for everyone else, it was kind of weird. Yeah. And, uh. Yeah, we actually shared a dressing room at the Presidents of the United States. <laughs> so, oh, man, wow. she's lump. Yeah. <laughs> Yo, <laughs> the funny thing about this fucking band, right? So, like, my friend wanted to, like, do some covers for Halloween. Uh-huh. So I went over there, um, played some guitar. He lives out in Oceanside, which is, like, forever. Away from <laughs> yeah. yeah. So he's like, oh, he, he gave me a list of covers, and one of them was lump. And I was like, I fucking hate this song. <laughs> and then I fucking look at it. And I start playing it, and I remember how it goes, and it was a lot of fun to play and sing. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Good times. Like, I don't know. Like, once... Can't we do peaches? <laughs> uh, the deep cuts. No. Yeah, the deep cuts. <laughs> yeah, but Lump, lump, like, when, I don't know, I was playing they, they it. They had their moment with that, you know? Uh, yeah, but uh, I guess. That's all you can hope for. Yeah. You know? They'll end up on the uh, Everclear tour soon, one day. You think so? I mean, I don't know. He always brings out like the '90s dudes and shit. Yeah. So yeah. they're doing Maybe. like, yeah, they're doing uh, Marcy Playground, Dishwalla, and a bunch of other shit at the, like the Paramount. I saw that Fuel. Ad. Fuel's headlining. Were they were they bigger than any of those bands? They played at uh, CPI when Did I they? worked there, <laughs> opening for Creed. Oh, yeah. nice! And it was right. Creed had put their big album out. I don't remember the name of it. You know, with the arms wide open, it had all that stuff on it. Yeah, and they booked the gig at CPI, which is kind of like low rent. It's a big place; it holds four thousand people. Or whatever. Wow, four thousand people! But that's insane. It was beneath them, so the record blows up. But they already signed the play there, so they were not happy about it. If I remember, Fuel opened it. Yeah, yeah. Creed was drawing graffiti, shitty graffiti all over the walls. They were total pricks. Yeah, shocker. Get out of town. Yeah, yeah they were fucking. <laughs> That's funny. Assholes. But Fuel was there doing that Shimmer song. I wonder song. what fucking, like, once I you like get, that song, actually. Which one? Shimmer. That's a good song. It's a good song. That's a good song. Yeah. Uh, but I wonder what, what, like, turns you, like, when you're Creed and you have, like, no, like, gratitude. You know, like, you're getting... It was only him. It was only him? Yeah. Because I... I I haven't. I didn't really interact with him much, but the the guitar player that went Tremonti, out, yeah, the Alter Bridge. He's a really nice he's a guy. Great guitar player. He's a very good guitar player, and his, he's a hell of, He was a great guy. It was just. It was just Scott's dad. Yeah, a shocker. <laughs> Yo, shout out to him. Wherever he's probably <laughs> listening right now. Yeah. But he, uh, the dude, uh, 
like some of those songs reminded me and I'm going to catch shit for it, but like his guitar work was like almost like hum. It had some like really cool, like heavy drop D type tunings to it. And then that dude ruined it with his fucking he, vocals. In interviews. He was into some heavy shit. Yeah. He's a big Slayer fan, all that other stuff. But yeah, that was when all those Yarl bands like <laughs> well, were doing the, we always Pearl said Jam this thing. Alice in Chains, amazing yeah. band. Every band that they spawned, worst band on the planet. That's right. The Ramones and the Clash like spawned so many great bands. Yeah. Alice in Chains, as amazing <laughs> as they were, like their legacy of like bands that they inspired, terrible. Yeah, there's a long. Looking list. at you, Godsmack. I'm looking <laughs> at you right now. <laughs> Candlebox. <laughs> I don't end my Candlebox though. Uh oh. Um. So you said yeah. things turn bad. Yeah. When did they turn bad? Probably, I guess. I guess this is like fall two thousand five. The EP was out, and we did a tour with Simple Plan, and it wasn't something we really wanted to do. But the money was good, and there was nothing else to promote that EP. So we said, "All right, we're going to do it." That's a really fucking weird tour. Yeah, we didn't really think it was going to work, and then we're like, you know. The, the money is good and we'll get out in front of a whole lot of people. And there were some people there. It wasn't as big as we had anticipated. Were uh, you playing like uh, just like theaters? Yeah. Yeah. And some of them got scaled back on the tour and everything. So we were kind of bummed when, when that stuff was happening and none of our fans were coming out to pay that ticket price to see us play uh, for like half an hour or something. Right, right. So it was one of those kind of soul sucking tours and they were super nice guys. They're very accommodating and you know, I can't say anything bad about them, but that that's just the way of things course. were. And, and it's just like, it's the contrast in the yeah. two bands Yeah, is like very like, I mean, man, they, it's just so different. Yeah. Especially for what you guys were doing by that point. Um, it helped us. You might, be introduced to a whole audience of people maybe that normally yeah a- yeah that we were just like if we're playing in front of like five thousand people a night if we take away 10 percent of that crowd yeah. kind of liking our band that's pretty good of course, sure so let's give it a try and also we went into it with a mindset of okay we had the ep fulfilled our contract with victory we were free agents and we we're going to shop around but what we really wanted to do we wanted to take the money from the tour and make our own record exactly as we saw fit work with the people we wanted and then shop that around. So everyone around us would know what they were getting into. And we thought this is going to sort out any labels that weren't really into what we're doing. The band was evolving. The band was changing and we knew we were going to do something very different from the self-titled record that I came out first and then the EP. And like uh, then whatever label we're going to put it out with should be really excited because we fronted all the money and this is exactly what we want. So best of both worlds. So we did that. We recorded that record. I think it was summer 2006. Where'd you guys do that? Finished up. We did it in an office space in Pennsylvania and uh, we, <laughs> we, we did it with our friend, with our friend Brian and, um, and, and Mike Sapone helped out a bit with it too. You guys have a complete connection to him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we had done the early Taking Back Sunday demos and everything, and that's and I mean Eddie did movie life demos and stuff with him in like '97. Yeah, so that went way back, and we shopped the record around, and Universal Republic was the biggest proponent of it, and they knew what they were getting into, and sat in my condo with us in the band. We listened back to the record after it was mastered and done, and. They're like, listen, there's not really a single here, and we know that's not what you guys are going for. So as is for the needle, yeah, for the needle of space. And they said, you know what? I think we're gonna we're gonna be able to easily sell three hundred to five hundred thousand copies of this. As is, if you want to do a million, we should get back into the studio. We're like, we're great with three hundred thousand copies. Yeah. Hell yeah! <laughs> so I'm great with three hundred. Right. Our record comes out. <laughs> they they tell us to do the warp tour, and we begrudgingly did two weeks of the warp tour and yeah, Kevin Lyman has always been great and everything. But for us, that was kind of a grind that we didn't really want to do. We didn't know how well piano, low key piano music, acoustic Mm -hmm. guitars and stuff would translate to the warp tour crowd. 
but we did it because the label's like, man, it's gonna, it's such a great promotion for you guys. We're gonna make sure everyone knows about the record. Who was on on that tour that year? Oh gosh, I don't even remember. Yeah, exactly. We we hung out with Bad Religion the whole time. Our tour <laughs> yeah, managers listen, were, were that's awesome <laughs> friends. Yeah, yeah, love those guys. So we got to hang out with them the two weeks we were on it. But yeah, it was them, and I, I forget. Like 2006, you said 2000. Warp Tour was 2007. Oh yeah, wow. sorry, I'm messing up my time. The last one I went to was like 2003. And then I was like, pace. Yeah. I just yeah. went to go see Alkaline Trio. Nice. I was I like, all right. I remember the last one I went to. I remember my friend was playing there. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, Which one? years ago. In this moment, played there. Uh, oh, okay. I don't even remember what year they all blur together. What kind of time slot were they giving you? Like, were you guys... Like, normal. It, like, it, pr- like we were playing pretty much afternoons and stuff. It okay. wasn't it wasn't like opening. Right. You right. know, which is really cool. And uh, we we were happy with the tour, and we would do signings after our set, and there'd be and the record had just come out, and there would be a line like wrapped around, It'd be like a couple hundred kids wanting us to sign stuff. We're like this is amazing, and every single one of them asked when our next record was coming out. The record had been out for like two weeks already. The label did zero promotion, zero anything, thinking just based on our name they would do what Victory had done and sell as many records. <clears throat> Yeah. They were so wrong. They totally screwed up. They totally sold us a bill of goods that we believed. And it was infuriating. Okay. And we're just like, this record's done. We sold like 30,000 copies opening week, which back then wasn't very great. Now, now it's huge. Like, oh, yeah. huge. And they You'd be us. number one now. Yeah. 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 They, they cut us like almost immediately, like within, within a month of the record being out. And we were just crushed. And we never really recovered you, from that. How do you get cut? Like, will you get like an email? They call you in the office, or I think they told our manager or our lawyer or something like that, and and that was really it. And it was such a bummer. We were just like we put our heart and souls into the making four, that record yeah. exactly how we wanted. Yep. And uh, yeah, so there were a lot of things wrong. I don't think we toured on that EP, uh, the Prepare to Be Wrong EP with Hands in the Sky, Big yeah. Shot. I don't think we toured enough on that. I think we could have gotten another good headline run out of that. But we want to go in the studio and really take our time with the record. I think we took way too long making that record. I think it's a kind of weird record. There isn't a lot of accessible stuff. You really got to listen to to fall in love with those songs. I Um, didn't even know it came out till we had that conversation. There you go. There you go. And that was most people that liked the band. Yeah. They were just completely unaware because there was no promotion. There was no anything for it. We did a really expensive video for, uh, for one of the songs and just no one saw it. <clears throat> they gave you the budget for for the video yeah 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 huge huge massive major label budget so, and uh just all so like, like the four so smoke. it's like what uh michelle john mm-hmm. you and will yeah and then from there once you guys get cut like what what what's the like what do you say to each other i said all right you know let's just keep going let's what was keep going. The, what was the game plan just keep touring, doing doing what we do. Keep playing shows. Hopefully, win people over and seeing if there's anything out there. And there just really wasn't. We kept touring. Less and less people were coming out to shows, and it was pretty abysmal last year or so. Being in the band, Michelle left somewhere along the way. Uh, we did a support tour with the used. It was all colleges and stuff, and that was really fun. It didn't the used, really do used kind of came back. Sure, yeah, the used is doing great. Yeah, because yeah. they um, hopeless bought up. You know, they got. Taken back. Yep. I mean, they got basically everyone. Yeah. Like your, your, uh, your peers. Yeah, all our ill. Which is super cool. <laughs> um, wow. All right. So th- I guess that's like Michelle leaves, mm-hmm. and uh, would she do Destry right away? Right yeah, away? she did Destry. I was doing that with her for a oh, bit. You did that with her? Yeah. Yeah. Fuck the, out the, here. the first record I played on with her. We went out to California. We recorded that. She was writing some really great songs. I yeah, said, it was hey, great. If, if you want me, I'd love to be a part of that. Oh, that's awesome. Because Tyler, who was writing songs at the time, I thought he was fantastic. I toured with his old band, North Star. And I always thought North he was a really Star. cool guy. Yeah. That was the first first real tour Taking Back Sunday ever did was with North Star. We got in Eddie's soccer mom van and went down south and, <laughs> and, and home. And it was horrible. We slept on strangers' floors, like, wherever we could. Right. Yeah. And that was, like, the only hardship Taking Back Sunday ever had in the early days <laughs> was that self book tour after our little demo came out before we got signed. Yeah. Like, Let's what go it, take the show on the road. We got to do it. <laughs> that tour was hard because we played in places and we didn't have a record out and it wasn't like playing shows at home. Mm-hmm. But we had to go through that process to really see if we could do it. Yeah. And prove to labels, too, that we were something worth signing because we had done this tour. So... 
everything i guess just stops you go do do the destry record yeah. um straight like the two eps self-released like basically right to the internet and uh seven inches did john and john moved out of long island right um yeah john moved to kansas in that time so he that, met his wife in kansas oh, okay. and he met there to to be you know a little bit closer to her family and stuff yeah. shout out to mr softy right now for yeah. uh, you know, he's going right late. Back. Job, yeah, he is going late, right? Yeah, good but actually, <laughs> you figure it's nine o'clock and he's killing it right now. Yeah, I mean, it's not even summer. He's got to get that money he's in. You know, yeah. they only got a limited window. That's true. Yeah. I mean, they got it, it is. Yeah, it's a seasonal thing. I mean, my I, dad owned one actually. Briefly. Really? It's awesome. yeah, we had one one summer. It wasn't that awesome, fan. Yeah, no. hard work. Well, actually, my brother had talked him into it. Getting dead, it. Like, dead. I'll I gotta, split the shit. Really I'll do whatever. This yeah. is not because I grew up on the it's East, like getting a dog. East End, and he didn't do shit. Yeah. So my dad's like, "Fuck, I got to drive this ice cream truck." The whole family's eating, like, "Oh, you know, the <laughs> Buffalo Bills for free." Soft serve, motherfucker. You know, we didn't have the soft serve. Just pops, chocolate, oh, class, really? strawberry shortcakes. We're eating all the profits. <laughs> and know? then they owned a fucking Seven Eleven. Like, fuck this. Sold that <laughs> shit right away. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Uh, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a quick break, and then we're gonna just bring up um, how you came back to the band. Sure. Cool. Uh, okay, yeah, we're back with uh, Sean Cooper. You're in the shitty part, right? So yeah. You're thinking like, you know, the band goes on indefinite hiatus. Mm-hmm. Um, you figure John's just going to make a solo record. Yep. And you're, you know, at that this point, like, what are you thinking to yourself? I called my dad up. I said, we, uh, one of my dad's best friends works for Amtrak. I said, dad, got to get Uncle Kenny on the phone. If he can, if he can get me in with anything, I got to do something. I had met my wife at the time. I knew we were going to get married at some point. I didn't have any way to provide for her. Long I Island. Was, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just knew I was. I, I needed to make a change. I need. Okay, it's time to grow up. Like I knew at some point I'd have to go back to work or school or whatever. So this is it. And my dad said, "You know what?" I was like, "Hang on." It's like, "Hang on." Let's just see. Let's see this thing out. Like. You know, your grandmother needs some work around the house. Maybe you can help her out. We'll get you a little cash here and there. Fucking Mr. Cooper, man. Yeah, he goes, he goes, just, just hang on. He's like, I don't know why, but don't commit. Give it like a month and just, just see what happens. You might find something. Nobody's like, that's awesome. That's very cool. Yeah. My dad totally would have done that. (laughs) My mom would have been like, it's a bad fucking time. Yeah. I'll go get you a broom immediately. <laughs> yeah, my dad's very practical like that, you know. Because what's a month in the grand scheme of things? You yeah. know, if I'm if I'm a screw up, like if I wait a little bit longer, maybe I come out of this. And mm-hmm. but if I commit to that, like I'm committing to that life, and I was all in. You know, I'm like, okay, I, I got I got to live my dream for a little while, and that was awesome. Yeah, because like sucks the way it ended, but man, I had a great time doing it. Totally worth it. Yeah, you did it, at that point in time. You did most than most people. Yeah, yeah, you know? I was I was shocked. I still am. You know, at that point, I said, "Okay, I got to do the thing. Let's let's move on." Yeah, and then uh, so when does Mark call you? Mark and I were hanging out. My sister in law lived around the block from where Mark was, and we were having a bunch of drinks one night. And Mark and his wife came by, and we're just we're just talking. And we're getting pretty hammered, and he goes, "Man, I, I really want my band back." And I said, well, that would be fun, but it's never going to happen. I, In my eyes, they were doing great. I didn't know about the internal struggle. I think because Mark was really looking out for me and not telling me about yeah. how annoying the guys in his band were because yeah. I had nothing. You know, he knew the crowds were dwindling for Straylight and, yeah. you know, things were collapsing. And he just, oh, well, I don't like this guy so much, even though he's still making money, still having fun, you know, playing yeah, shows of course. and everything. And that was when he started to let on the internal stuff that was going on and how uncomfortable he'd been for all those years and how many fights he'd had with this guy and that guy and how if John and I came back to the band, maybe things would be right. I said, well, man, I, you know, I'm in, but it, you know, I know Rubano and, and Adam are tight and John's doing a solo thing. I'm like, there are so many different pieces that have to come together. Like if, if you can make it work, I'm in. But did this happen within the month span? Yeah, yeah. This is like probably this is probably like a week after I had that talk with my motherfucker. Dad. Yeah, yeah. Things are weird. So he mentions that, but again, I think it's a pipe dream. There's no way 
There's no way. And then Mark and I went out to a bar with John. John was playing a solo show. We all met up at a bar, just the three of us. And he's like, yo, do you, John went to the bathroom. And Mark's like, do you think I should tell John about this idea? Do you think I should ask him? I'm like, man, I don't know. You really, I don't think he had talked to Adam and Eddie about it. And I didn't think John was going to go for it. I didn't think he'd be open to it at the time. I'm like, let's just let it ride tonight. Hey, has Did John not talk to either one of them at that point? To like Adam? No, no, they hadn't spoken in since, in years. Since yeah, then? like probably wow. close to seven years at That's that point. Wild. And similar to Eddie. Oddly enough, I had kind of reconnected with Eddie a little bit at Mark's wedding. I flew out to Detroit when Mark was getting married. That's right. Yeah. And I had seen Eddie and we had a really good time together. I'm like, man, it'd be fun be around this guy again at some mm-hmm. point. And then but yeah, didn't think anything of that either. And so I just, I, I was just like, man, don't, don't bring it up to John just yet. Like, let's have tonight and let's just have fun as friends. And then, you know, if someone's maybe may we'll make phone calls, I'm like, talk to the guys about it. If they're in this and that, um, then you can talk to John. But and it was great because we just had a really, really fun night. Just three friends was it hanging local? out. Yeah. We we're in Rockville center. Okay. At uh, whatever the bar is called. I think it's changed names, but, uh, yeah. Yeah. So we just had a, had a really good time. But I could see the possibility like that night. I was like, hmm, maybe, you know, I could tell John was having a really good time hanging out with Mark. Yeah. And I'm like, well, all right, well, maybe there's something to it. And then basically Mark got in touch with Adam and Eddie and and discussed that and just talked about that night and what fun we had. And if we could do it again, that'd be pretty great. And finally, Adam was like, yeah, dude, make the call. Wow. And since that had happened, I was just like pace around at my parents' house. Mm-hmm. Like, did you make the call yet? Did you make the call? And Mark and I would go back and forth and, and freak out about it. He's like, dude, I talked to John and he's in. I was like, no uh, way, dude. Yeah. So you just, I mean, it's, it's really a story that never happens. <laughs> like, I'm trying to think of how many times it's actually happened. You know? It's a rare one. It's a yeah. rare one, completely. Yeah, sure. You know, did you even listen to the other records you weren't on? I did a little bit. Um, I I really wanted to hear where you want to be because I wanted to see where they took it. Yeah. And um, but like by like new again, you didn't. Yeah, like the the thing was, I would by. So I kind of I, I listened to where you want to be maybe once, and then I put it away. Didn't think any more about it. And then um, when louder now came out, I was all I was at a bar. I was at home. I wasn't on tour. And I heard Make Damn Sure for the first time when they played like Jimmy Kimmel or mm-hmm. something. And I just was like, they did it. They did that it. song is a hit. Good for them. Like, yeah. I was so happy for them. You know, by then enough time had passed. And yeah, everything. and you were doing your thing. Yeah, yeah. I was just really, really thrilled for them. And they had that song that could be huge and really encompassed what the band was. Really represented them well in the best possible way. I said, hell yeah. And then really didn't think too much about it mm-hmm. after that. And they just kind of went and did their thing. And then new again, you know, I think I heard uh, the sink into me sing. I said, okay, that's a, that's interesting. That's definitely weird, but interesting. And I, and I, I like it. I like that one. It was a Mm -hmm. different direction. So, but, um, so then everything starts moving and, uh, I guess you guys all meet up in, in Texas. Yeah. Yeah. We, we had a conference call. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Conference call kind of on the sly and, we agreed, hey, let's meet up in Texas. We don't know if this is going to, you know, where we start off. We don't know if this is going to lead to anything, but let's hang out. Let's talk. And we have a studio if we want to try any songs. We got it right there. I'm like, okay, let's give it a try. And then Mark was in Australia with the band, and we would talk like every day on Skype. He's like, dude, I'm so miserable. I want you guys back right now. So, oh, so it wasn't even like, um, I guess they didn't even make the move internally yet. No, because we we had no idea that this would work at all. And there were like the band was kind of finishing up plans. They finished up the Australia tour okay, and then there yeah. was like nothing on the agenda. And I think um Matt Fozzie wanted to take some time off too, so they had like a really just open ended period after that was done to figure out how they were gonna write the next record. Yeah. So they took that time like, Well, let's see what John and Sean are up to. Yeah, definitely. And, and then we, you get in, and uh, what was the first thing you guys did? We drank all the Tecate. 
<laughs> All of it. Did you guys hang out uh, at the drive-in? Any of those guys? Didn't no, we, we had hoped. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Jim's kind of become a, a friend. Get the he, fuck run, out of yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. He, yeah, Stray Light toured with Sparta. Sparta? Yeah. And yeah. I love, uh, I love Sleep stuff. Car. Mm hmm. Right? Was that yeah, the name of the... Yeah. Right? Because, like, my friend Dana would do your PR as well as, yeah, uh, yeah. as there. So they opened up for Old 97s, mm -hmm. and I saw them. I was like, yo, fucking Jim from, awesome. from At The Drive-In's got this band, and I, I loved it. I love that record. I know he did a solo record recently. Oh, did he? Yeah. That's awesome. I gotta um, check it out. I think we're gonna see him again. We're playing his venue in El Paso when we get down there this summer. Oh, this, cool, cool. Yeah. yeah um, I love the new At The Drive-In record. Unfortunately, he's Me not too. on there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, but he's such a big part of it. Yeah. You yeah. know, like I can't believe they got the guy from Sparta though. Mm -hmm. So that works out. But man, like, yeah, Jim Ward and like those like relationship of command was like a, a game changer. Absolutely. When I heard that, my ears were like, wait, what the fuck is this? Yeah. So, um, so you guys go down there and then, you, you know, you, you make you know, you start writing the songs and when was it that they were like, yeah, this is it. This is like, we're, this is it. I mean, there's first, no turning back. First night, first really. night, first night we were just like, yo, dude. I, I think I just we, picture all five of you guys spooning each other on a bed. <laughs> that's pretty much what it was for like the, the first whole year. And, and I mean, it still continues to be, it just kind of evolves, but we just, um, we just knew immediately that the chemistry was still there. We started we started writing El Paso, and I think Best Places to Be a Mom was like the first song we put together. Oh, what is it? Is that the... What's it? I think that's my favorite song off that record. I think it's like song three. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Yo, that is like the catchiest song I think you guys have ever done. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I really like that one. I'd like to start playing it uh, again. fucking melody on mm -hmm. that. Yeah, it was catchy as hell. Adam started coming up with that melody, and that was really the first one that came together, and we, we could feel it. Yeah. said, okay, we still have that old chemistry. There's something about the five of us in a room working on music that something comes out that's bigger than us. Plus, you left when, like, when you were so young, and here you are, you are you're older, yeah. more life experience, bigger picture. Yeah. Like, look, you know, we made such great stuff together. Why yeah. can't we do it again without, a, you know, a lot of other distractions, that, that I would stuff. think. Yeah. You yeah. Know, now you guys are, like, fucking grown-ass men with kids, and it's like, yeah. okay, you know, this is, this is it, man. This is what we do. Like, mm -hmm. do you guys see, I mean, do you... Like 15 years from now, this is what you want to do, right? I sure as hell hope so. Yeah. You know, that that's really what we talk about being the dream come true, being able to sustain this and provide a nice life for our families and getting to do what we love. Yeah. Because I think a lot of times with all the, the behind the scenes stuff and, and the rigors of just being on tour, it's very easy to lose sight of about how much you love playing shows. Mm. Just, just that visceral thing of getting out on a stage and I feel like I need that in my life. I broke my hands a little over a year ago, and I couldn't. I couldn't play one show. I missed. Was it with a your jujitsu? It was. It, it was, was you motherfucker. Yeah, a guy pulled on my hand, and it just stayed on the mat and slipped, and it snapped. But it snapped my middle finger, and I couldn't play one show. And I was, and we had been home. We were working on the tidal wave record and stuff. So I couldn't play that one show, and I was so devastated. I'm like, I need this. Because you're a fingers I, guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was my left hand, too. So there's uh, no... Uh, they're like, you can't even hold something. Yeah. yeah. You know, like you could figure out how to use a pick yeah. or something if it was my right hand, but it was my left, so any... The strings are thick, too. Yeah. It is. <laughs> and and uh, can you switch it up? I mean, like, I think once you're, like, a finger man, like, you're, you're a finger man, right? I do both. You know, there, there was one... There's, like, a couple songs on the Tidal Wave record I used to pick, so yeah. I, I can pull it off. What, if, what's... what what? Like what is it just like a different feel? I mean, I don't know. Yeah, it, it's on on the song All Access. There's a bit of a bounce to it. It's uh like so I use all down picking to okay. get super nerdy. Everyone's gonna tune out now. Nah. Like all the gossip <laughs> the drama. Like here's how here's how I play with. There's the ten pick. people loving this yeah. conversation right now. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I know. Uh, I think it's Tony Lombardo, the original bassist from Descendants. Yeah, the all down strokes. And he's fast as hell. He would put yeah. a weight oh, on his arm and everything. So when I play with a pick, it's all, all got to be down right. strokes. You're, he, he put the weight. Did you yeah. watch Filmage? Yeah, 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 yeah. I loved it. Love that movie. <laughs> I have the Blu-ray over there. That's uh, back to Johnny Ramone, man. Yeah, oh, exactly. Just man. Didi. All yeah, Didi like, too. Didi down. did it. Down strokes. And I, I heard, I think it was uh, CJ was saying the secret to it is if you wear your bass really low, mm -hmm. your wrist can get 
your wrist can get in on the action. It's not your arm going up and down, going uh, down, you know, making that motion. If you use your wrist, you're a lot faster. Oh, wow. When I was younger, I mean, even just recently, I just started, like, bringing my guitar back up when my hand gets cramped. Yep. Because um, it does if I'm, like, muting. Mm-hmm. Um, slash. I was like, I want to play like him. And, mm-hmm. like, my guitar would be, that like, low. Need. And, like, I was always a uh, rhythm playing singer. Um, so like I could do it, but like, it was just for that reason. Yep. Like I just liked it low and like, as time goes on, I'm like, fuck, I gotta like fucking concentrate. And it I, looks I, cool I, as fuck. Too, he looks cool I, as fuck. I, I could never play my guitar low. Yeah. It was always hot. Not like high, like fucking, you know, fifties, but I could never go that low. <sighs> Man. I think the lowest I've ever seen was the guy, the bass player from the cure, Simon Gallup. Yeah. Oh that yeah. That thing like drags on the floor. Yeah. <laughs> I just saw it, man. Yeah, definitely. Down there. Um, all right. Well, that's that's uh, one of my favorite rock stories. And the fact that uh, I get to do some dumb podcast with my friends. Yeah. And uh, you get to tell us that story. is like, great, man. So Yeah, I mean, we've been back for seven years. And it feels like it's gone by in the blink of an eye. I, I, like, yeah. I can't get over it. Then it's 2017. And when we were having those calls. 2017. Yeah, when we were having those calls, it was... 2010 yeah wow. i'm just like where, where did it go how did we put three records out since we've been back three records and yeah. you're fucking playing an island yeah you yeah. know yeah yeah it's bizarre like how the fuck did you guys like you guys are playing an island <laughs> you know what i'm saying yeah, like, i don't know for, I don't like know. for four days i think it's yeah said. yeah we're there for four days so it's perfect though you got your family with you all you guys you get the show you get paid i mean you can't like <laughs> that's a you know, paid vacation. That's it. Like I mean, uh, like not even like John Holmes would be jealous of you guys right now. <laughs> You'd be thinking like shit. Well, you know, I, I want to so. go play. But the last record, Tidal Wave, super kind of different. I think it's the one that took the most chances out of the three. Mm-hmm. Um, were you guys just thinking like fuck it, let's just try this? I think a lot of times we would take our influences and. In- and trying to think, well, what would that ver- what would Taking Back Sunday's version of that thing be? And then the song, like the title track, Tidal Wave. Yeah. We're like, this sounds like the Ramones and the Clash. Let's not change it this time. Let's go with the natural feel of this instead of trying to make it what, you know, we're not going to have a, like a halftime mm-hmm. bridge or something like we normally do. No, it's pretty straightforward. So we're just like, let's embrace this for what it is. And let's not to try and change things to make them take it back. Sunday. Let's just feel what feels right. Because none of us are, are musos. We don't really read music. And some of us don't know what the notes on the neck of the guitar are. But... <laughs> <laughs> everything everything is gut feeling yeah. and i feel like when the five of us are on the same page with that same gut feeling with the direction of a song it turns out to be pretty special yeah. so i think that's how we work well together and what we were able to embrace uh way more fully than we have in the past yeah that's awesome and and i mean you guys have been just doing it for so long that it's like i mean do you feel like you're getting better or do you feel like you've peaked Definitely. No, I think if we felt like we peaked, we'd call it a day. I'm talking about like just as far as like uh, skill wise for your bass playing. Like, do you feel like like you, you know, you're at the peak of your game right now? No, I think I'm I think I'm improving every day. You know, I'm listening to more music like I just I just bought the Appetite for Destruction tablature book. Did you I'm like I need to learn all Yo, those guitar solos. This motherfucker is legit Guns N' Roses, <laughs> man. Yeah. I am. You know, Duff McKagan. Yo, those oh, bass lines. He was real, like, just listen. Appetite is just perfect. It's Everything perfect else, record. you I could agree. punch a hole through, uh, but th- just that 1987 piece of music, twelve mm-hmm. fucking songs. They it's got so it all right. Man. It's so easy being the best song on the planet. We all know that, please. <laughs> um, well, you know what I heard? I heard the whole thing with the reunion of Guns N' Roses was because people forgot that it was so easy to please axel so they lost sight of that and then when duff and slash got back together they just had to try to please him yeah and then they're like oh this can work yeah this can work because they what they forgot is that everyone's when everyone's trying to please him you don't have to please him right but you have to try 
Interesting. Ego stroke a little. He bit. well. I'm just fucking. I just oh. saw it. <laughs> this guy. I'm like, I think he's joking with us, but I'm not sure. I'm just gonna roll with it. I saw it. Um, I gotta verify it, but I think it was announced officially that Axel's the new lead singer of ACDC really? at RollingStone.com. Like for real? I gotta double check. I don't. And I'm like, sure Anthony and yeah, Hugo and Anthony, anyone else that the watch likes and to Hugo. fact check us. Yeah, the watch and Hugo. But fact I check saw us. it that they announced <laughs> that they that was happening. I fucking hate that. I hate it. I hate it. I I think it was cool maybe for like that tour. Mm-hmm. It just makes no fucking sense right now. And Not with the lightning that you know what Guns N' Roses is riding on right yeah. now. I mean, but if they went in and made a record, would it? I don't the know. The original, could they? I don't. I don't know. There's something just so unappealing about it. Um, I mean, listen, who the fuck am I? But yeah. I don't like it. Like, I don't like it. But here, here's another mm-hmm. thing. You figure ACD, like any band in that position, like watching the Rat document, no, uh, Quiet Riot documentary. I was about to say there's a Rat documentary. <laughs> I got to get out of here. <laughs> Let's check my fire stick. Let, yeah, the fire. <laughs> Shout out to the fire stick. It's probably in the works. But uh, the Quiet Riot documentary, which is phenomenal. Did you watch it? Yeah, I did. Mm-hmm. W- what's so great about it is it, I don't know what it is. You know, the drummer, Frankie Benali, like he decides he's going to form a band without everyone else. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, Kevin Dubrow can't. But mm-hmm. part of me is like, I don't want to begrudge the guy because he's just trying to make a living. And if he can make a living, Mm -hmm. then so be it. But the other part of me is thinking like, yo, what the fuck are you doing right now? (laughs) Like, what, you out of your mind? Like, you're starting a band with no other member but you, and you're the drummer. (laughs) Like, You could probably just do session work. But, I mean, you know, like, I guess if he really enjoys it that's what i'm saying you know? like i'm torn you know did, did so quiet see- riot really have this untouchable legacy that you don't want to tarnish <laughs> i mean like i was saying they the had same- one record i was saying and had- the first and- record to what Go make number- it to number one yeah right? first metal record. metal record yeah um with a cover cover is awesome but the bro it's had a cover. big voice man he had a great sure. voice and 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 uh but like watching the documentary I was thinking to myself, like, aside from that, you know, they're like one, two year, you know, height. Like, uh, you would think that they were the Beatles the way this movie was carrying yes. on. Yes. <laughs> <And then> the, <laughs> but I think that's what makes a good documentary so fascinating. Like, you know, we always bring up the Anvil, Anvil. one. Yeah. Because it's like these dudes just like you guys never you guys were terrible in 82. But, you know, yeah. but to them, they're still. It's 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 terrible. Part of it's laughable and part of it's so beautiful. Yeah. That even like no matter, maybe they do know that, but they don't give a fuck. Muse, making music together is yes. so important to them. That's, that they don't care. That's what and shines that's through. Awesome. That's you know? what shines through on, on in the movie that I respect because, um, I mean, listen, I came from work. I'm like looking at like, you know, our album, right. you know, yeah. going like, yeah, today's our album. I'm like, all right, you know, like the hundred people that give a shit. Um, but that's what it is. So that's what the movie relays. Like it's um, lips and the other dude. They have this friendship. Yeah. And they're going to work, and then they're making like it's like their adventures. Yeah. In making this music. But what I like about it is sometimes the delusion in the movie where, where that dude lips, you know, like uh, I think one of them's like, "Hey man, uh, you should be playing to a thousand people every night," and he's like. That's what I've been saying. <laughs> <laughs> he sounds like fucking like in Boogie Nights. <laughs> it, it's like Our an, shit is just that good. It's like an Ed Wood kind of syndrome. You know what I mean? Like Ed Wood made some of the worst movies ever made, but he just wanted to keep making them. Yeah. yeah. Did he know they were that horrible? Did he not give a fuck? Did like what was it? But he just kept doing it because that's what he liked to do. And I I respect the passion. Yeah. Because we all you have, have to. it. Yeah. We're sitting here fucking talking on a podcast. Yeah. Grown men. Hoping yep. people are yeah. tuning in. People people have been liking it though. So they have. I've been very encouraged. Yeah. You know what I mean? They're like, you, you guys are all right. We got a worldwide following. Yeah. <laughs> you oh, know, yeah. we got twelve people in uh, Ireland that Sick. listen to us. So. That's awesome. <laughs> a, guy, a, a guy in the Philippines too. <laughs> We're really big in the Philippines. Nice. You know, just throwing it out there. You know, you're not the only successful one in the room. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> you know? I love it. Yeah, so, it's fun. As long um, as it's fun, man, you keep doing it, right? Definitely. It goes so, for anything. 
I want to uh, wrap it up and thank Sean for absolutely. No, thank man. you for having doing me, this pleasure, last man. minute. I'm glad we could crowbar it, and uh, that's it, man. Fucking, we will wrap this up. Got anything, Langan? No, I guess we'll just have to figure out when we're just gonna air. Right? Uh yeah, because we just put like we'll, we'll figure it out because we have a whole bunch that yeah. we got to do in the can. It's a busy month. It's been a busy month, yeah. but I think. I think anything that you start off, you need to just basically like do last minute. That's it. When something comes up, what was I going to tell you? No. Um, okay. And I'll hit you up in June, July. It's like, I can't. It's like, when can we do it? Then you're going How on are we tour. Gonna do it? You know? Yeah, that's it. Gear, let's make it happen. Make it happen. So. Yeah, I appreciate it. But no, yeah, we appreciate you. Absolutely. Definitely. Man. Thank you for coming down. And um, I'm going to get you another can of uh, seltzer for the ride home. <laughs> Thank Taking you. Back man, Sunday is like the number one fan, uh, friends of the show. Yeah, that's it. Absolutely. We got two we members got two. covered. That's it. That's right. Long Island guys. The right? rhythm section. Yeah. The backbone, baby. <laughs> yeah, the backbone. That's right. All right, so uh, we'll see you guys next time. Adios. Bye.